Yeah, it says live. Live, we're live. Okay. So, um, as soon as anybody's here, we'd love them to type into the chat box where they are and um, what level they're studying at. So, if they're doing GCSEs or AS or A level, we haven't got anybody here yet. <laughs> um, select the button to answer a question. So some people are asking if this is going to be recorded. Yes, it's going to be recorded and um, sent out later. Um, so that's great. Um, if you're watching the replay, oh, hello, we've got our first viewer, four viewers. Okay, brilliant. Hi, folks. Hello, welcome, everybody. And thank you so much for sparing the time this evening to spend with us. Um, I know that this is going to be packed with value for everybody that comes along. We've got 12 people now, so that's fantastic. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm just going to wait for a few more people to come along. Um, while we're waiting, if you could type in the Q&A on the side of your screen um, where you are, because I know some people from all over the world have signed up, but even if you're in the UK, tell us where you are in the UK and what level you're studying at. So are you studying GCSE, AS, or A2, so we know roughly who we're talking to today. Um, Martin... Um, specializes in working with sixth formers but i think the strategies that he's going to talk about today are just as applicable to gcfc students and the earlier you start to use them the better you know you start practicing the better so we've got 24 people here now so that's fantastic thank you everybody for coming along 27 now <laughs> so um just um, while we're waiting for a couple more people to come along, um, if you haven't already, if you pop over to my Facebook page, that's Life More Extraordinary, um, if you just type in the Facebook search and like my page, and um, that would be brilliant. Um, so I can keep better in touch with you using that. And also, um, you can follow both Martin and I on Twitter. I'm um, at... Lucy C. Parsons and Martin is at A Level Mindset on Twitter. Okay, we've got 43 people here now, that's wonderful. So we've got Angelica who's in Leeds and she's studying A Levels, and um, Bethany is doing GCSEs, and there's somebody from Leicester, so that's just up the road from me, so that's fantastic. Um, so I think we'll start now, Martin, if that's all right. We've got lots and yeah, lots of people sure. here. So just to introduce myself, my name is Lucy Parsons, and I run the website lifemoreextraordinary.com, where I share lots of advice on how to um, ace your exams and get into the university of your dreams. Um, and you'll have signed up for this um, workshop through my website. Now, a little while ago, I discovered Martin on Twitter um, and his yet to be published book, um, A Level Mindset. And then one of the dads of my children um, it really enthusiastically told me about Martin and his work while we were at our children's nativity play, which was a little bit random. But anyway, he was gushing about it. And I was like, I have to um, get in touch with Martin and see, um, get him to share what he knows with the people who read my blog and are on my email list. So um, that's, it's fantastic that Martin has decided to give up some of his time today to share his wisdom and knowledge with us. So Martin, could you just give us a little bit of your background, who you are, and what gives you all this expertise? Of course. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. My name's Martin. I'm a deputy head teacher at a sixth form in Oldham, which is near Manchester. And I've been there for a period of time. I've been teaching post-16 for nearly 20 years now. And particularly in the last few years, we've been looking at the effect that character has on exam performance as opposed to... Well, I suppose if there was one trait that you might associate with exam performance, if you were just thinking about it, you might think, well, intelligence is going to be the key kind of defining factor that, that determines whether a student is successful in an exam or not. It's all going to be to do with how intelligent they are. But our studies year on year have shown that there are, that there are some significant factors that are overlooked. 
to do with the way students think, uh, behave, organize their work, the way they think about challenges. These, I think, are all kind of characteristics, character-based um, kind of factors uh, that are distinct entirely from intelligence. So we began looking at what it was that made certain students successful uh, in exams or under A-level. That's been the kind of work that I've been doing for the last few years. Fantastic. So what we're going to do today for everybody is, um, I hope you've got your handout, so I've got mine printed off here. Um, we're going to go through, um, firstly, for about the first 20 minutes, Martin's kind of five pillars for yeah. success at A-level, and he's going to explain what they are, and I'm going to chip in a little bit with some of my experiences of those things. And then we're going to do the... Um, exercise which starts part way down the first page and goes on to the second page um about how you can revise better and in less time so which it sounds like an amazing solution <laughs> for everybody so let's hope it works for everyone so martin you've got this five pillar system for success at a level can you tell us what it is <laughs> yeah of course i was uh, and working alongside uh, my colleague steve oaks we've uh, and a number of a fantastic tutor team as well we've come to the conclusion as i was saying earlier that really it's a series of personal characteristics that determine academic success as much as anything else and we call these uh, characteristics vespa uh, v, E, S, P, and A. V is for vision. That means, or what we, what we choose to understand by that is the idea that students who have a goal, students who understand why they are studying GCSEs or AS or A levels, what they're going to get out of it, what, what the benefits are and where it's going to take them, students with that vision or goal, uh, do better than students without that vision or goal. Now, crucially, that is uh, totally outside of any notions of intelligence or not. All right. So put that to what if you're a student listening to this now, forget notions of whether you are in inverted commas clever or good at a particular subject. None of that's important at the moment. What I'm arguing is that students with a lot of vision and a sense of goal and direction do well, and okay. students lacking that begin to struggle no matter how gifted they might be okay can i chip in there because i think a really important part of my story is the fact that i had a really really strong goal so um it's a bit extreme i know but at the age of nine i decided that i wanted to go to cambridge university <laughs> and um from that day onwards i worked my socks off to try and achieve that goal and it was a struggle for me it didn't come naturally to me to get the top grades and you know to achieve that goal but i always had in my mind like, i've got to study this evening because if i'm going to achieve that goal then you know, it, it's not going to happen if I don't put the hours in, if I don't put the work in. And it was so motivating for me. And ultimately, I think having that motivation is what really drove me to get the five A's that I did at A level. So yeah. I, know, I know not everybody's going to have that same goal, but having a motivation, having something to hold on to, to keep you strong and keep you going when the going debt gets tough is so important. It is, yeah. And what we found is that a lot of students, I mean, you, in a sense, Lucy, some people might be listening to you and thinking, wow, if only I'd had uh, mm. that kind of sudden realization at the age of nine that. <laughs> A lot of other students will set shorter term goals and might think to themselves, my goal is just to get onto these A-level courses. And then, of course, during September, October, November, December, where are we now? January, February. They might have felt, well, I've, I've made it. I'm on the courses. What am I here for? What am I trying to achieve next? So they might not know the university uh, that they want to go to, but I think students can still set short-term goals what, yeah. what do i want the summer to feel like what do i want my results to be like what grades would i be happy with at the end of this particular year where do i want to move on to following that so yeah even even if you don't have a long-term goal like lucy did when she was nine or ten you can still make effective short-term goals i think 
Yeah, I think the other thing I'd add there, working with some of the students I've worked with in my Get Motivated sessions, is that actually some people find it really hard to know what they want to do with their A-levels or even for a degree course, but they can see what they want their lives to look like in, in 10 or 15 years' time. And so actually thinking about, you know, what kind of family life, what kind of house, what kind of social life, what right. kind of work environment they want to work in, actually that's more motivating than thinking about the, the immediate next step, which is, a2 or a degree course or whatever and it's something that they can see more vividly in their minds and latch on to that's right because creating a I mean, interestingly there is a difference between a dream and a goal mm -hmm. you didn't have a dream about studying at cambridge you you uh, galvanized that dream and you turned it into a goal by taking a series of actions about it mm -hmm. so that's the other thing that students need to do and that we all need to do i guess as we as we move through life and that is continually try and turn dreams into goals by taking action and moving forward Definitely. Okay, so that's all about vision, which is the V on everybody's yeah. worksheets. So what is the next thing? Uh, uh, the next thing is E. E is for effort. You can see this one coming, I'm sure, but there is a link between the amount of effort students put in and their success. There might be people listening who might think, well, hang on, look, there are some people who are supremely kind of gifted, genetically um, very lucky and are just born brilliant at maths or science or languages. We don't think that's the case and every single time that we've investigated uh, the performance of our top students, and we do this a lot, we interview them after their exams, we find that the students with the best grades are the ones that have worked hardest. There is no truth to this myth that uh, uh, lucky, clever people can get by without doing any work. I've never seen any evidence to support it in 20 years of teaching. So what we've looked at carefully is precisely how much effort students are putting in to get top grades. Uh, and we began to therefore kind of normalize that level of effort because un understandably students don't know. You might, you might be friends with a group of people who don't work particularly hard. You might not know what other students are doing. You'll of course have no idea what students in other schools or colleges are doing on average say so it's very hard to pin down what hard work looks like mm -hmm. when you've no kind of specific examples of of that yeah well i i can say for sure that i worked extremely hard yeah. to get five a's at a level and uh, when i talk to students i say you know if you're looking to get an a you should be doing at least four to five hours of independent study outside school per subject That's per right. week um, Let's mention that because that's that fits precisely our findings of, as well and that is for a four AS course uh, high performing students work around about 20 hours per week independently so yeah you're talking about four to five hours per subject that's what we find as well if you want an A or, or, or um, an A star at A level you need to be at around about 20 hours per week climbing up from that as you hit the exam season. Yeah yeah definitely so yeah effort it, it, it's crucial for, for me following on from the vision the vision was was what gave me the motivation to put in the effort to achieve what i achieved um okay shall we move on to s what's yeah. what does s stand for s is for systems and by systems we mean levels of organization particularly for resources and for time one of the tricks at a level is seeing um the whole understanding the way the entire subject works and, and I think the average A-level student will pick up something like 500 sheets of paper across four courses in an AS year. Uh, students who can organize those pieces of paper, make sense of them, make connections between information because they've got everything stored and sorted will do well and students whose resources are chaotic and ability to organize their time is chaotic Will do badly again remember this is entirely uh, outside of this idea of intelligence we're not talking about intelligence students doing well well organized high systems students will succeed uh, and others won't regardless of their previous performance okay so what kind of systems you know uh, what would an ideal system be for example for time management it's, it's an interesting one. What a, a lot of people will do is, is use a list. Now, what, what we'd argue is, um, 
and in fact, actually, we work with quite a few students who'd kill for just, you know, a decent list that tells them at least what they have to do. The, the, the students who perform least well are the ones who don't even capture the jobs they've got to do. They don't miss homework because they can't be bothered doing it. That's a low effort student. A low system student misses homework because they've forgotten it was even set. They yeah. haven't written it down. So what we encourage students to do is move away from list making, which is quite a linear way of organizing your work and doesn't allow you to prioritize strategically. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of systems that allow you to consider your jobs in, in terms of more than one variable. A list will give you a, a series of tasks to do according to deadline and you'll just churn your way through them. Once you're considering tasks on a matrix uh, and you're considering level of importance versus level of impact on your learning and you're considering two, two variables at once, you're, you're in a position where you can sequence your jobs a little bit more strategically and do high impact jobs first. Okay, so can you give me an example of a high impact job? Yeah, well... I, Here's a, a metaphor we often use with students. There are, amongst all these jobs that you've got to do, 10, 12, 15 things you've got written, written down, there are jobs that are lead dominoes. Think about your jobs as a kind of, as a list of, as a kind of long line of those dominoes standing up. Some jobs uh, have an impact on, on subsequent jobs. If you can get them done, it makes a job that comes later on either easier or sometimes totally redundant. You don't need to do it at all. But what students will often do is pick off dominoes towards the end of the line here, simple things to do, when they could be choosing a high impact job that makes subsequent jobs simpler. Yeah, so maybe an example I could think of is when you first come across some information or a skill in the classroom, to really engage in it and learn it properly the first time round, mm -hmm rather than thinking, oh, I'll just come back to it later when I'm making revision notes and not really bothering with it at the time that you first learn it. That's right. Now, and, and if you take care of some of those kind of ugly jobs early on, the ones that where your heart sinks a little bit and you think, flipping heck, I've got to go over that again, got to go through the textbook, I'm not quite sure I know it. They're the kind of high-impact jobs that are actually going to make subsequent homeworks and tests much easier. So successful students will pick off jobs they don't really want to do, but they know are high impact. Okay, that's brilliant. Okay, so that's systems. So systems yeah. is all about keeping your time and your resources. So all your bits of paper and your textbook and your notes and all that kind of stuff really well organized. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah. that's crucial. And again, I think that was something I was quite good at when I was at school. I didn't know I was that good at it at the time, but listening to you, I think I was. Okay, so what's P? P's for practice. What we've found is that students will often put in large amounts of effort, but then not make the right kind of progress or not make the kind of progress you might expect. And, and there might be people listening tonight who think, I'm putting the hours in and I'm still not making headway with AS chemistry or AS biology or I'm putting lots of time in on physics, but I'm still not, not getting the results I want. I'm picking these subjects at random, of <laughs> course. Um, uh, often what we find with students like that is that they are not practicing in a way which fully develops their understanding of the subject. So, and, and, and in fact, P is going to be the subject of tonight's session, isn't it? So I won't give too much away. We can talk about in, in, in a little bit more detail about practice, the context. Everyone who's listening has got one of these sheets with them anyway, haven't they? So I'll, I'll take them through, through that a little bit later on. Okay, brilliant. So we'll move on to A, the last... Yeah. Five things. That's right. A is attitude. What we found is that students, I think, I think a positive attitude, opt optimism is worth about a grade and a half. I think what will happen is students who are resilient, who are emotionally uh, tough enough to handle a setback or a failure, who understand that mistakes are information and that setbacks uh, are great learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. Students like that. Uh, will, will, will succeed. And again, regardless of intelligence or previous performance, students with a strong attitude will do well. And students with glittering GCSEs who find um, setbacks or failures uh, dispiriting 
will do badly because those students will eventually begin to withdraw their efforts. They'll think, I can't go through this. This punishment is humiliating. You know, I don't want to get a D or an E. I'd rather, I'd rather stop trying than carry on. So there's a very clear distinction between uh, students who are um, tough enough and positive enough to see challenges as opportunities and mistakes as information. They're the ones who do well. So, so it's all about really positive self-talk. So if you've got a little voice in your head saying, it's too hard, I can't do it, it's too difficult, blah, 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 that's going to do you a lot of damage in terms of your achievement. Whereas if you're saying, I try hard, I'm giving it a go, I, I can do this, and will, willing yourself on with positive self-talk, you're going to do much better. That's right. There's a, a, a psychologist, Albert Ellis, American psychologist, that I'd recommend you have a look at his work. He calls that negative self-talk uh, crooked thinking, and he actually subcategorizes uh, different types of crooked thinking. Um, we write a little bit about this in the book. There are, and, and uh, I'm so sure students out there, as soon as they see kind of examples of this crooked thinking, such as catastrophization, um, I'll give you an example, for example, catastrophization. If this test goes wrong, uh, my whole life is ruined. That's an <laughs> kind of exaggeration. But, the, but of course, uh, one element of crooked thinking, and I do it, and I bet you do as well when you're under pressure, is to uh, significantly um, kind of exaggerate the potential negative consequences of something going wrong. So students who experience crooked thinking and negative self-talk often get themselves into very uh, low places and they feel defeated and they, they feel like they need to withdraw their effort. Whereas other students see setbacks and failures as part of uh, the kind of journey towards progress and success. Yeah, I, I just wanted to share a little anecdote about me when I was doing my A-levels and um, I was doing geography coursework and it was in the very early days of computers and um, I hadn't saved my work and I'd written dozens of pages for my um, A-level coursework and the computer crashed and I lost it all. And I remember lying on the bedroom floor, kicking and screaming <laughs> because it had all gone. And I kicked and screamed for about five minutes and then I sat up and I thought, well, this isn't going to get the job done, is it? And I just got back up and I sat back at the computer and I started all over again. And I got that thing done. And I think I got about, well, I pretty much got full marks. I can't remember exactly because it's a long time ago. But, you know, it, it's that I can do this. I've got to do it. Pick yourself up and just get on with it. Don't let the setbacks hold you back. Yeah. And uh, uh, another thing that we all experience, and students listening to this will have experienced it, and, and my, I do and you will, yeah. is, is that kind of self-critical voice as well. Some psychologists refer to it as imposter syndrome. That is the feeling that I don't really belong here. Everybody else is cleverer than me. I'm just clinging on by the skin of my teeth. Um, uh, you know, no one else is having to work this hard just to keep up. And of course, none of that's true. You know, you've got to believe us. None of that is true. Uh, and what you also need to understand is that all of us have these critical voices in our heads that say, I'm a bit of a fraud, actually. You know, yeah. I'm only here uh, out of luck. I didn't deserve those GCSEs. So you've also got to tackle that part of yourself that, that keeps telling you the story that uh, I'm not worth this or I'm not clever enough for this, because you are. Definitely. Everybody's worth it. And right. I, be I believe that everybody can do it. If they put these things into place that you're talking about, then they can do it. And it's just about deciding to do it and getting on with it, really. It's true. Year on year, we see uh, students with very, very good GCSEs hit a ceiling at A-level because there's an issue with vision or effort or systems or practice or attitude. Nothing to do with cognition, you know, with intelligence. It's to do with other qualities. So if you're feeling uh, sometimes a little bit defeated or beaten by some of your studies, um, you've just got to come back to this idea that the characteristics you have within yourself are enough to face down the challenge. Definitely. Yeah. 
That's fantastic. Okay. Okay. We should move on, shouldn't we, I guess? Definitely. So um, if we move on, I'm going to hand over to you, Martin, to do this because you're much you're better placed to guide us through this. So if everybody can see at the bottom of their first sheet and it says part two. So, Martin, do you want to take it away? <laughs> yeah, I mean, what, what we've got here, let me just check. Let's, let's all check that we've got the same thing in front of us. Uh, I want to share with you a questionnaire about revision tonight. That's the one that we've got, isn't it? Can I just check that everyone's got that with them today? Yeah, so you've got a kind of a table um, like that. If you can type into That's the, the one. box. That's the one, yeah. Yeah. So let's have a look at that. The, the reason I chose to share this with you tonight is that we've made, uh, uh, we've worked with students who've made some significant impact by auditing the way in which they practice. This is a practice activity. Okay, so it could be okay, that. Sorry, Martin. Can I just interrupt? Some people are saying yeah. I haven't got it. Okay, um, if you haven't got it, just listen along, and um, I'll send it out again with the replay, or uh, put it underneath the replay tomorrow, so that you can, uh, so you have actually got it. But listen along, and um, yeah, just do your best with it. Yeah, I tell you what. Now, in in fact, I think we can do this uh, even if some people haven't got the handout because I'll, I'll kind of describe it more than refer directly to it on the paper so you needn't worry okay what i've got here is an activity about the way in which students practice okay so what i'd like you to think about is how you revise revision is a way of practicing mm -hmm. um, and um, you, you might have experienced this you might have gone to various teachers who might give you very significantly different ways of, of revising. They might say, well, in my subject, you need to approach it this way, or revision in my subject looks like this. And that's really understandable. Your, your teachers will have revised in a certain way and learnt in a certain way and been very successful in a certain way. I'd like, I'd like you to think about revision in a different way for the next 20 minutes or so, regardless of whatever course you're on. Some people tonight are listening, doing their GCS others doing A-levels, some might be doing maths and sciences, others might be doing government and politics, sociology, English literature. It doesn't matter. Revision is a three-step process of practice. And step one is learning the content. Okay. Now, what we found when we do this questionnaire with students is that that step one process, the learning the content, uh, is often where students will stop. In fact, some of you might be listening thinking, learning the content, isn't that it? Isn't, isn't that the, kind of the whole point? There's nothing beyond learning the content, that's what I'm here for. And what we found is that underperforming students see revision as a process of mastering content, that's all. So they do lots of work on mind maps, uh, uh, recopying notes, they might use highlighters, they might be using little cue cards with lots of information on them, they might be reviewing textbooks, they might be going over and over their notes, and they might have various kind of strategies for going through notes, compressing them further, or putting them in text boxes or bullet points, or turning them into PowerPoints. They, they might do other things to review content, they might be on YouTube watching kind of online lessons, recapping content. And what we found is that students who think that that is what revision is will significantly underperform compared to students who take the next two steps because step one is, use, is revising and understanding the content. Step two is engaging in high stakes exam skill development. Okay. Now, what we've found when we speak to students is that they will wait until the very last minute to do this. They'll tell themselves, before, before I start any of that, I need to have all my content sorted out. So, excuse me, ra rather than start a past paper question, I'm going to spend another two weeks making a thousand more flashcards, and then I'll get onto that later on. But we've found that students who begin to engage with the exam process early and begin to test themselves uh, under time conditions make significant steps forward so that's learning the content and then immediately getting yourself into exam based testing and then there's a third stage after that as well and that is seeking feedback on your performance so content skills feedback 
Now, when we've spoken to students, we found they spend about 80, if you, if you take the whole of their revision, right, and you say, here's the, here's the, I don't know, the 70 hours I spent preparing for my A-level in geography. When, when we check the proportion of time students are spending in these three zones, the content proportion typifies 80% of a student's time is spent there. We know that because we've asked them. Skill development, 15%. Feedback on performance and adjusting performance, 5%. Now, th there's a problem here. Students are spending too much time uh, mastering content and not enough time in the more uncomfortable work of skill development and then feedback. So whether you've got the handouts or not, what we've developed here and what we can share with you is a questionnaire that asks you to audit your own revision. I'll read a few things from it. So you've got to tick in the always, sometimes or never column, whether you do things like this, read class notes, use course deck textbooks, make mind maps and diagrams, highlight and color code, use flashcards, build a revision wall to display your learning, okay? And these are all content strategies you'll notice. These are all things to review precisely what it is you need to know. But what do you need to do with that content? You should be writing exam answers under timed conditions, reading other students' model answers written under timed conditions, going through every past paper and planning answers or responses to those past papers. You can see immediately this is a different kind of practice. It's high stakes, it's uncomfortable, um, and it's, it, it doesn't make you feel good putting yourself in that situation. What's much more comfortable is sit, sitting on a sofa with some flashcards and perhaps doing a little bit more content revision. But what students need to do is move out of that zone more quickly into that discomfort of testing themselves more regularly. Then think about these strategies, and these are all feedback strategies. Marking your own work to a mark scheme, comparing model answers against your own work and determining where the differences lie, uh, working with examiners reports, or crucially, handing in extra work to your teachers and asking them to assess it and give you some feedback. So what we've found is that um, some of these really hugely valuable practice techniques under um, skill development and feedback are being ignored by students because they are quite understandably, given GCSE requires you to do this, they are focusing on mastering content and then not moving on to skill development and feedback crucially. So think about where you are in those three zones. And if you, if you just think back perhaps over a session that you've recently completed, you might have just gone through a couple of hours of revision maybe this week or perhaps over the weekend on Saturday or Sunday and think, right, what kind of revision was that? Was that content revision? Was it that uncomfortable skill development revision and practice? Was it feedback? revision where I was reviewing uh, the feedback a teacher had given me and adjusting my performance. And if you're like other people, you'll find, wow, I'm spending a lot of my time here mastering content and I need to move more quickly on to skill development and feedback. So that's what the activity asks you to do. Yeah. Have I got a little bit more time on this so that I can just tell yeah. you a little yeah, more? Yeah, keep going. Okay. So once Lucy gets a copy of the questionnaire to you, have a go at it. And if you've got one, one with, it, with you now and you've got it in front of you, also have a go at it now. There are three columns. All I'd love to know if anybody has been through and ticked and, you know, whether you could just type into the comments whether you've yeah, mainly got yeah. content or skills or feedback, things that you've discovered that you're doing. So if anybody um, does have that, that would be great. I've just had a question. How long does this last? We're going to stay on this for another five to eight minutes. Yeah, and then five minutes or so, then we'll answer some questions. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Good stuff. So audit the way you're working at the moment. And what we've found is that uh, students who perform better have a larger number of 
ticks in the always column. So here's the trick, folks. Those students who are getting better exam results are not just working for more hours. This isn't just an effort thing, okay, because we're talking about the practice element of the model, the P for practice. Students who perform better in exams have a wider range of revision activities. We've worked, for example, with students who in the always column have ticked maybe two or three things. And they'll say, I'm doing 16, 17 hours independent study a week, but I'm doing the same thing over and over again. I'm rereading notes, I'm checking textbooks, I'm going on the, the virtual learning environment now and again, I'm watching some YouTube videos. And students with a kind of poverty of variation in what they do are repeating those activities over and over again. What we found with high performing students is they will be doing two or three content activities, but then they will be writing an ex exam answer under time conditions. They'll be going through a model answer. They might have reviewed a, um, an examiner's report and pulled out the key errors that students are making nationally. They might have handed in an extra piece of work and they might be auditing the feedback the teacher has given on that piece of work. Or they might have booked a 10 or 15 minute appointment with a teacher to say, look, here's a section of the syllabus I need your help on. So students working more effectively in the skills and feedback zones are the ones uh, who are making significant progress. Yeah. Just to finish then, if you've got 10 ticks in the always column, you're probably heading in the right direction because that means of the 20 tasks available here, you're doing at least half of them. If you've got four or five ticks, my guess would be most of those are up in the content zone. You're doing class notes, you're going through mind maps and diagrams, and you need to expand the variety of tasks that you're completing. So if that's you, the, the way to do it is to have a look at some of those activities and tasks that you're currently not doing at all. And you need to make a pledge, right? Okay, next week I'm going to pick out this activity and this activity. I've never done them before as part of my revision. And I'm going to block out a portion of my time. And I am going to complete an exam question under time conditions and hand it into my teacher and book an appointment to discuss uh, what my performance was like in that particular exam. Brilliant. Okay, we, we're getting quite a lot of questions now, which yeah, are very relevant amazing. to what we're talking about. So a lot of people, um, so I've, I've missed who it was, but one person says everything they're doing is content work. Then yeah. somebody else, um, Kelsey, says a lot of content and some skills. And um, Paige, hello Paige, I know okay. you. She says, well, dang, I have like two ticks that aren't never. So she's not doing much of it at all. And um, Stella says, I filled it in and I've found that I spend more time doing content stuff, but there's still only five always boxes ticked. Um, maybe I've underestimated myself, but it's an eye opener. I definitely need to do more skills work. Yeah. Now, um, Marion has asked, and I know Marion's actually a student from France, and so her system's quite different over there. She says, how can you reduce time spent studying? Oh, I've lost you, Marion, somewhere. It, well, she, how do you reduce time spent studying if you're um, spending eight to seven, seven to eight hours per day in school? And I think the answer to this is you by adopting a really efficient approach to studying so one thing that i learned to do was choose an exam question at the beginning of a study session then go back and revise the content that you needed to answer that exam question answer the question then mark it okay find out you know what mark you would give to it because that way you're learning to think like an examiner and then um if you didn't get full marks, go back and work out why. If you can't work out why on your own, then go to your teacher to get feedback. So that concentrates a lot of these different skills that um, on different ways of working that Martin is talking about into one study session. So you're covering from content through the skills to the feedback all into one. And that makes it much, much more efficient than just going over and over the stuff that you need to know rather than how you need to use that information in the, in the context of an exam. 
That's fabulous. And it's what we call a, a revision power hour. If you can, in one 60-minute session, do 20 minutes of content. This is pretty much precisely what you've described, Lucy. You do 20 minutes of content revision. So you've got to choose a section of your syllabus or course that you can hammer in 20 minutes. Then you do 20 minutes of high stakes, uncomfortable, exam-based practice and it might be writing the first half of an essay or completing a long answer question or just a, a subsection of exam which is testing the content and then for the final 20 minutes you're going to mark it you're going to perhaps check an examiner's report or you can you're going to compare it against a friend's piece of work and you're going to go through those three steps very clearly now that's going to be an exhausting hour you will get to the end of that and you will feel flipping heck i've been to work for that hour you'll really feel it but um uh, the the acceleration forward that you will make compared to someone who might have spent the equivalent hour drifting slightly aimlessly off topic trying to read a book um kind of waking up suddenly and realizing that their mind had wandered you've done something very intense in that hour yeah. And payoff for that is so significant compared to someone who might have been sit at, sitting at a desk with some coloured highlighters going through some material. Yeah. And that's the difference. I talk about active and passive revision techniques. And a very passive revision technique would be taking the textbook and reading it. Slightly less passive would be taking a highlighter and highlighting the key words in that textbook. But a really, really active way of revising would be having that really purposefully taking on that content in order to answer a specific revision question, a uh, um, past paper question, and then yeah. using that content, really using using it actively to answer that question and so you've kind of got a spectrum from passive techniques to active techniques and the more active you can be in terms of your learning you're testing yourself you're stretching your skills you're employing those skills you're using your knowledge the better it not only is the knowledge going to stick in your head but you're going to develop all the other things you need to develop to get the high marks in the exam that's right and i think I, just to reinforce what you've said there uh, Lucy, there is a particular kind of learning which occurs when the challenge is high and the required skill is high as well. So imagine uh, that there's a, a psychologist who describes the process of working in that way as being in flow, okay, mm -hmm. L-O-W, flow. And you feel like you're in flow when um, you are challenging yourself, but your level of skill is just about right for meeting that challenge, and you are completely absorbed in what you're doing. Now, uh, flow work is working under time conditions. It's uh, responding to a, uh, a task with 20 minutes to complete it. It's, it's that feeling of your brain buzzing as you try and solve problems. And I think a lot, if you, if you check your revision to see Am I high skill, high challenge, or am I low skill, low challenge? And if you're low skill, low challenge, you will feel things like boredom, uh, listlessness, uh, tiredness. If you're high skill, high challenge, you, 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 you will not feel those things. You'll be feeling uncomfortable. You might actually be feeling slightly kind of excited by doing it. Yeah. And get to that weird stage, and I can see it in Lucy's eyes as well, that weird stage where... I actually quite enjoy this. This is hard and difficult, and I'm getting somewhere with it as well. I, I, I used to love that feeling that new synapses were being made in my brain, mm. like new connections were being made because I was l actually learning. And I used to go to bed after a revision session, and it would still all be firing off because yeah. I was excited, and my brain was trying to kind of... It, assimilate and compute all that new knowledge that I'd taken on in that revision session and I mean it's crazy um, uh, some people think I'm crazy but I used to go into exams and really enjoy them because I was in that state of flow and it was exciting because I was showing off what I knew to the very very best of my ability and I have complete confidence that other people can have that feeling too if they put these 
techniques into place. Now, it, it turns exams from being a scary thing into being a really positive thing where you just show off what you're good at. And it turns revision from a very passive, kind of desperately dull kind of activity into something where you actually feel slightly uncomfortable and a little bit kind of excited about what might happen and am i going to improve on on on, on my performance last time so what i'd what i'd recommend doing um if you've got a few minutes after this session is just typing flow f l o w into a google search and if you hit images there's a lovely i think it'll show up there's a lovely kind of grid with skill and challenge which will and it's got these little emotions labeled on it that you might feel you know boredom or tiredness or whatever with a low skill low challenge task but you might notice some of these feelings and think yeah that's where that's where i am i'm in that quadrant when i revise you should be in a state of flow you should be pushing yourself up to a state of flow okay We've got a lot of questions and we're kind of answering them, but not quite directly. Okay. So, um, we've got a question from Freya and she said, if you're late in learning the content, should you jump straight to exam skill development? I kind of feel like we've answered that in that if you take, like choose a practice Thank question you. and do do the content to answer that question, then do the question, that, that that's what you need to do. And in some ways it won't matter that you're late learning the content because you're doing the high stakes stuff when you do that. Yeah, the, only thing, the, the, the thing you should not do then is think, well, look, I'm going to block out six weeks to learn the entire course and then I'll move on to skill development. You need to be moving between the three zones as you go. And I think actually you might be quite surprised at how much of the content you do know already. If you just sat down cold to an exam question, you probably wouldn't score zero. <laughs> you might know something already. And yeah. That might give you some confidence and then you've got something to build on from there. Okay, um, I've got a question, um, Jack's question, something about, oh, how do you find the motivation to do one to two hours work individually after the school day? That's an interesting one. Here, here's my suggestion. First of all, uh, an hour might not have to be an hour, okay? An hour could be 48 minutes for me. I just stumbled across this, Jack. Is it Jack has asked this question? Yes. I think yes. I stumbled across this thing that 48 minutes on, 12 minutes off was absolutely perfect for me because I could set a timer and then I, I would give myself this little 12 minute reward. And I would not say that I'd done 48 minutes revision. I'd say I'd done an hour's revision because for me, the process of kind of winding down, listening to a piece of music maybe, getting up and stretching, going outside for a breath of fresh air. That was as important as the work itself. So that's the first thing I'd say. Think 48, 12, 48, 12. All right, yeah, so. and never ever sit down and think, I'm going to sit at this desk for two hours nonstop and study effectively for that amount of time because it will not happen. You're setting yourself up for failure. If you're planning to do more than two hours work in a revision in a day, it needs to be split into chunks. And that will vary, you know, it's 48 minutes for Martin. I think for me, it's about 50. You know, it, it varies from person to person. Two minutes better than I am. <laughs> but you know you were and it might change from day to day as well but yeah. you, you kind of start to feel when you're getting tired and it's not working anymore and when you start feeling that stop because you're wasting your time when you get to that point give yourself 10 or 15 minutes off and then go back to it but never please never anybody sit down for two hours and think that's an effective way to revise because it's not or start your session thinking right here we go three hours at the <laughs> what a terrible way to begin a couple of other pieces of uh, advice for jack what is um an interesting piece of work um about habit uh, which says that you should well two things jack you should never think about breaking old habits all right you should think about forming new ones that's much more positive in your mind to think i'm going to create a new revision habit starting on monday as opposed to i'm going to break a load of old habits i hate myself for now, uh, a good habit needs three things. Number one, a reminder. Number two, a routine. And number three, a reward. Three R's, luckily, Jack, so you'll remember that. So you set yourself up a reminder. It might be a, your phone goes off, that's it. This is the start of your 48 minutes. 
you set yourself up a routine it's going to be 48 and it's going to be focused and it's going to look like this and then you need a reward you need to set yourself up with something jack that is going to be like a punch the air at the end of that 48 minute session and it might it might be a, a cup of coffee it might be a piece of chocolate it might be uh, 12 minutes listening to a couple of tunes that you're really into it might be um it might be getting up stretching your legs going down chatting to your brother or sister uh, but but a reminder of routine and a reward is what you're after yeah Four definitely habits and not breaking old ones i've got a blog post that talks about how giving yourself those little rewards um yeah. and I'll, I'll try and link up a lot of these things when i um send out the replay tomorrow so people can have a look at them um okay we've got an interesting um question from page here it says so if you want to revise multiple subjects per evening oh i've lost you now page where's it gone these questions jump about um oh no it's something to do with if you want to do basically four subjects in an evening and um have a power hour in there as well okay Ooh. here it is so if you want to revise multiple subjects per evening and want to do a power hour as well one do you do each subject in one evening i do four and two how do you break properly during something that intense that's an interesting one isn't it i mean four subjects in an evening strikes me as um much. too much yeah i would i would be focusing now I've, I've just talked about my 48 minutes 12 minutes if i was doing that i'd probably do two subjects per evening um that way i could i could do two hours that that way um it's an interesting one because uh th that's a question of sequencing and organizing according to need isn't it so how about this as a way forward draw yourself a big grid page all right and on the vertical axis up here you're going to have high quality at the top and low quality at the bottom and on the horizontal axis you're going to have ahead of schedule behind schedule so what you're doing with every single one of your GCSEs is first of all assessing it on the horizon sorry I'll get my fingers in the right place assess it on the horizontal axis am I ahead of schedule with this course am I kind of where I should be or am I behind schedule and you place it somewhere on that line but then you're also making a judgment about its quality am I pleased with the work I'm doing here at the moment is it high quality is it where it should be or is it low quality and what often when we do that with students they'll begin putting little crosses for where their subjects are they might say right this is I'm ahead of schedule with sociology and the work I'm doing is of a high quality so I'm going to put that up top right and then they might say with German well, I'm actually behind schedule with German and the work I'm handing in isn't getting the, getting the grades I want. So that's behind schedule and low quality. That way, let's say Paige is doing her GCSEs and she's got 11 subjects. She might then have a, have a, a much better sense of, right, where do I need to put my attention? Yeah, and that, that's yeah. something I talk about yeah. a lot. It's focusing yeah. on your weaknesses. Yeah. You can't afford to have weaknesses in exams. You you know, when you get older, you have the luxury of focusing your life on things that you're really good at. But when you're taking exams, if there's a part of the syllabus you're not good at, you need to focus on it even more so it doesn't pull you down in the actual exam. Um, what might be happening there is you might naturally think, well, look, I need to give every single subject the same amount of time. Mm -hmm. But I, I would suggest actually auditing how comfortable you feel about that subject and shifting them out about the amount of time you're spending on each one. As Lucy says, you must start with weaknesses. In other words, with things bottom left, behind schedule, low quality. That's where your attention needs to be to start with. Yeah. OK. Um, Jack said that he really liked the idea about the 4820. So that's brilliant. Thank you. 4820. 4820. Oh, sorry. I can't. Sorry. Um, okay, we've had a question about revision timetables. Yeah. Um, right, well, there's a couple of questions about um, revision timetables. So one is, is spending a few hours drawing up a revision timetable worth it? And then there was another one that said, basically, if you're doing, if you've got a revision timetable and then you get some homework and then another teacher says do this and another teacher says do that, you can't stick to your revision timetable how do you cope with all that stuff okay 
<laughs> we can both it. answer this together, can't we, Lucy? Because I bet you've got a load of uh, a, a lot to contribute on on timetabling revision. Personally, two hours spent creating a revision timetable is two hours well spent in my book. As long as you are, as I've just described, thinking about uh, sequencing and organising your time strategically, and you're not thinking, right, I must. I must split every single hour down into, you know, I'm, every subject deserves the same amount of time. It might not. It's up to you to audit where are my strengths and weaknesses and what do I need to attack first. A couple of a couple of uh, pieces of advice on constructing revision timetables. Number one, uh, make sure the breaks are in there already, okay? You don't give yourself absolutely punishing evenings. If you're going to establish a a positive revision habit. You've got to get through that first week with every single slot on your timetable complete. Mm -hmm. If you fail on week one, you will fail on week two and week three. So build yourself a timetable that in week one is eminently doable. So you get to that Sunday night thinking, I did it, I did it, I completed a whole week's worth of it. And then maybe week two is gonna ask a little bit more of yourself. Secondly, share it with your, your mum and dad. Yeah. If you've got the kind of parents that I was lucky enough to have, they were the kind who were on the door all the time. What are you doing? Are you revising? You should be. And, and I could share that with mum and dad, say, look, as you can see here, I've taken Thursday night off and Friday night off this week because this is happening or this is happening. I'm not slacking off. <laughs> I've not lost motivation. I'm sequencing my time so that I can go and do this. I'm going to this gig or I'm going out that night or whatever. So do make sure that, first of all, it's a doable timetable. Yeah. That, that, you, that you, you're scoring a victory by the end of week one because you've stuck to it religiously and that you're building in periods of, of of a break and sharing that with other people so you're not getting earache from your mum and dad when you're sitting watching tv you can point them to the timetable and say as you'll see from my schedule actually this, yeah. I, i'm due this hour i'm bang on track <laughs> um, <laughs> i've got a really useful resource that i think lots of people will like if they're thinking about setting up revision timetables and it's called a re revision planning kickstarter and it's basically you sign up for it and it's five days of emails in a row and it takes you through how to turn your boring old exam syllabus into um, a personalized revision plan that works for you <laughs> and it thinks about how again the kind of prioritizing strengths and weaknesses and getting yourself an accountability partner whether that's your mum or dad or dog or me or whoever it is you want it to be um and so it takes you through all those steps so again tomorrow when i send out the replay i'll include that as a link to sign up which you can use the thing i wanted to add on to the end of that is just getting started with the revision timetable and particularly at this time of year i think this time of year is really tricky because you're still learning the new content on most of your courses but your teachers are banging on about re revision as well and it's really difficult to strike that balance between the revision and actually finishing the courses and learning stuff for the first time so I would suggest that you do just a revision plan for one week when you've got some idea about the other things that you're going to have to build into that week as well so that you're yeah. setting yourself up for success in that week and you can see how it's worked and then the next week you can make yourself another plan for the following week you can adjust where your priorities are because your strengths and weaknesses weaknesses might have changed by that point you'll know which kind of homework coursework whatever tasks are coming up in that week a, a, a bit better and you'll have more understanding of how you work well so you'll know whether you're a 48 12 minute person or whether you're a 50 10 or a 45 15 you'll have a better understanding of those things and what things work as a revision break and how much time you need to take off before you go to sleep and that kind of stuff so keep building it and realizing it's a work in progress you're learning about yourself all the time and you're optimizing it every week as you move towards your exams yeah I'd, I'd totally agree with that and of course yeah the bit we missed about that question was what happens when teachers throw homework at you so of course what you need to do is factor in an hour on a Tuesday for um, you know immediate jobs that need picking off 
and doing and finishing. So you might have an hour on a Tuesday, you might have an hour on a Thursday, and you've just labeled it, you've kept it blank. It's one of those hours you're going to deploy on something that that is kind of, uh, I, I don't know, that's urgent or and important and needs finishing. So leave those little gaps. Um, and of course, if nothing comes up, if you haven't got anything set, then you can deploy that hour however you want. But you know it's there on Thursday night for you to pick off anything that's that's giving you grief. Yeah. Okay, we've got a question that I get all the time now from Kelsey. And she says, what's the best way to deal with procrastination? Ah, uh, okay. Right. My, way, right. my personal way of dealing with procrastination, it's called the 10-minute rule. Okay, Kelsey, here you go. This is what you do. You put aside all that stuff that you've been... Procrastination leads to a high level of, of self-loathing sometimes. Here I am again playing score hero on my flipping iPhone instead of, instead of doing my marking. Teachers get this as well. The 10 minute rule is this, you put everything aside and you say, I'm going to start work, but I'm only going to work for 10 minutes, okay? This is a, a little psychological trick you're playing on yourself, Kelsey, really. I am only going to work for 10 minutes. You clear your desk, you get the stuff out, you check your watch, nine o'clock, here I go, I'm starting, and you get going. And one of two things will happen, either, number one, you'll finish after 10 minutes, but at least you've done 10 minutes you wouldn't have done because you'd have spent the evening procrastinating. Number two, and way more likely, you will find yourself immersed in this task and you'll come out of a kind of daze, probably 30 or 40 minutes later, having really got into it. And then you're a winner. You're 40 minutes further forward than you were. Now, how many times have I tricked myself with the 10-minute rule? Well, I'm still doing it to myself now where I think, I'm not going to spend too long on this, but I, I am just going to do 10 minutes. And then you find yourself 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes later thinking, actually, I'm into this now. And what was hard, actually, was the thought of starting it. Once it's begun, it's actually, it's actually pretty pleasant. I'm going to carry on with this. A little bit longer try that one see how it works the other thing i'd add to that is have motivations built in i call them mini motivations so it's a bit like you know you know you're going to take your 12 minute break at the end of your 48 minutes work and you know what you're going to do in that time so if you love making yourself a banana and strawberry smoothie and you love drinking it and that's really going to keep you motivated then that's your motivation if you know there's a youtube video that your favorite youtuber has just put out and you want to watch it watching that is your motivation if you're a yoga addict go and do some yoga you know whatever it is that you that motivates you to carry on whether it kicking the ball about in the garden something like that promise yourself that it, that treat that reward and that will make it easier because you can only have that reward when you've done the work I totally agree with that. There's one other thing to bear in mind, and that is that your tendency to procrastinate is due to self-sabotage. There's a part in you, just like there's a part in me and a part in Lucy and a part in everyone else. There's a part of you that uh, a little kind of devil who doesn't mind kind of sabotaging your own best intentions. And uh, your self-control is at its strongest in the morning and the afternoon and at its weakest as you move towards half six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night. Think about this. If you were trying to do a day without chocolate, you know, half nine in the morning, you'd be fine. 11 o'clock in the morning, you're probably still just about, okay, I tell you what, by 3.30 or 4.30 as you're going home, that's the moment you're going to break. So if you're one who's who tends towards procrastination, do not sequence big, important tasks at half eight or nine o'clock when your self-control is likely to be lowest. Think to yourself, I know when I self-sabotage, it happens at 7.30 when this comes on the telly. So actually I'm gonna make sure this key piece of work is done between 3.30 and 4.30 instead. It's worth, when you're building timetables, thinking about when you're at peak yourself personally. Yeah, and willpower is, it's like a muscle, it gets tired the more you exert it. Yeah. 
So like as the day goes on, or if you've used willpower a lot during that particular day, it, it's going to evaporate towards the end of the day. And so just bear that in mind when you're planning out your tasks. Okay, we've got a really good question from Mark here. Um, are you all right for time, Martin? Yeah, I'm good. Um, he, Mark says, how many hours should we be putting in over the holidays, half term and weekends? Okay, I've got a blog post coming out later, that, well, it's probably going to be published on Saturday, um, about how what you should be doing with yourself at half term. Um, and some of my advice is that you do give yourself at least one whole day off because you need the break. And particularly at this point in the school year, it's like a marathon from now on, running up to your exams, and you've got to keep yourself fresh and think of it a bit like training for a marathon. You've got a different kind of training schedules. You've got days off, you've got breaks and all that kind of stuff. And you're not gonna be on top form by the end of June if you're not allowing yourself to take a whole day off in February half term. But putting that in place, um, think in terms of weekends, what you do at the weekends, you should be, like I said earlier on, if you're doing four subjects at AS or A A2, you should be spending four to five hours on each of those subjects every week, which is about 20 hours per week. So it's up to you where you put those 20 hours in your week. I used to do four hours every night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and the remainder at the weekend. It's up to you where you put those hours. But if you kind of I've got another blog post, which is the, the weekly routine of a straight A student. And it's just about thinking about how you're going to plan out your week so you get in the right number of hours to get the grades that you want. What do you think, Martin? I, I, I think there's a, absolutely loads of good stuff there, Lucy. A couple of other things to add to that, uh, just, to, just to kind of add to the end of your list. One option is this. You follow your... Uh, college timetable for a week but you do it at home you your school or college will have set it up so you're likely doing something like four and a half hours per week per subject you could just do a regular monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday and you could take uh, lucy's right about resting and you could take the two weekends off uh, either side of that and uh, sit at home and when it's when it's i don't know 8 50 on a monday morning and you should be in geography be doing hours geography revision when it's 10 50 on a tuesday morning and you should be in philosophy and ethics you do an hours philosophy and ethics that's one way of doing it that i think a, a number of our students have found useful a second one is to uh, commute to work over half term here's a nice way of thinking about this find yourself somewhere uh, that you're gonna that you're gonna go and study at that isn't your room that isn't your house um some students decide to go in to work with their mums or dads. If you're lucky enough to have a parent who works somewhere where you can perhaps mirror their working day for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday and then take a long weekend at the end of the week, uh, that might be a nice way of doing it. Alternatively, you might be jumping on a bus every morning uh, and uh, going out to a library where you do 9 till 12 and 1 till 4 and you do that, for example, for... Uh, four days and then you have a nice long weekend at the end to celebrate everything you've achieved a couple of things to think about there yeah I, I, that's exactly the library tip is the thing I used to do when I was at university because I had my room where I lived I worked I did everything and when it came to exam season it was like you felt like you were going to explode yeah you were confined to this one room and so I went off and I went to different libraries every day to have a little bit of variety and that worked really well so that's good um okay um we've got a question about overwhelm here i just see what the name is um why is it gone um, it's Kelsey again. She says, I'm currently studying sociology, psychology and chemistry. I'm feeling really overwhelmed with the amount of work. What's the best way to make sure I cover everything? I think that comes back to the revision timetable and the prioritising strengths and weaknesses. I'd agree with that. But there's something I'd add as well. Often when we work with students who are, who are overwhelmed, it's because they imagine the job is actually bigger than it is. The first thing that I would do, here's an interesting project management tool. Um, when you're beginning any big project, you, the recommendation is you've got to scope out four things. Number one, 
the scope or size of the project. And many students start revising with only a vague notion of what it is they've actually got to cover. So it might be that Kelsey makes a list of 15, 18, 20 things she needs uh, firm kind of and confident control of in order to get sociology. And, and actually, once, once you've made that list, you might think, hang on a minute, this is, this is way more doable than I thought, because as I'm looking down this list of 20 things I need to know, I'm realizing that seven or eight of them I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident on, and that only leaves 11 or 12 topics. So scope is the first thing, time is the second, quality is the third, and resource is the fourth. Scope, how big is the job? Time, how long have I got to do it? Quality, what grade do I want from this? You know, realistic, well, what am I aiming for? And resource, it's not just me. Who am I going to draft in to help me get through this? Okay, so it could be that half an hour spent now listing five people who could absolutely save your life Kelsey you know hand in you know, I, I can borrow the notes off this person I can I can use this website to review this content I can watch these videos to quickly cover this content and and students often feel it's it's me versus the world sometimes as they begin their uh, revision and of course that's not the case yeah and um, the, the thing I'd add that I think thinking about scope it's breaking it down into bite-sized chunks yeah, it's bulky, and, isn't it? yeah rather than looking at your textbook which covers the whole course and thinking oh my god i've got to learn that whole thing you think well actually if i do that you know that section on such and such then that's one bite-sized chunk and then i've got another bite-sized chunk so never think you're sitting down at nine o'clock on monday morning of half term to learn that textbook in one day that is the biggest mistake you'll ever make think i'm sitting down for 48 minutes and i'm going to cover this topic and when you start chunking up your time and the stuff you've got to learn like that, it will seem so much more achievable and more manageable. It will, so don't panic. Yeah. Um, Couple more minutes I've got, Lucy, and then I've yeah, got a dash. That's fine. Um, we had a question about um, eating and like what you eat and sleep. How does that affect your concentration time? I don't know any facts or figures on this, but I just know that the more the if you get eight hours sleep and you eat healthy food, you'll do better than if you don't. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting one. There are also interesting studies about screen time as well that seem to establish a very strong link between the kind of blue green light you get from mobile devices and the quality of sleep. Um, one of the biggest steps forward. I made recently with sleep because you know th this is something that, that students listening need to realize you know these aren't problems that suddenly vanish the minute you pass your exams you find yourself up at night thinking about other things instead uh, but yeah connection with good sleep and screen time means that if you can have a significant period before you sleep away from a screen that means leaving your phone downstairs and getting yourself a separate alarm uh, we found that students who use their phones as alarms almost inevitably spend uh, too much time on looking at the screen and then of course uh, neurons are excited by that blue green light and um, and the brain can't turn itself off so you need something in the way of escapist fiction that that'd be me i'd be reading something mindless and silly for 20 minutes before i go to sleep and the phone would be uh, well away from the bed oh, yeah, be... i have a rule no phones in the bedroom because it, if it's there you're like oh check it check it check it but yeah. if it's not then you can't it stays downstairs that's where it lives yeah um, we've got one more question i'd like us to cover um Ooh. And it's, do you have any advice as to how to balance A-level revision with wider reading to prepare for a degree course that's not what I'm studying at the moment? Now, the way I approach this is to set yourself a mini habit. And I, I do further reading to help me with my work. And my mini habit is I have to read two pages of the book I'm reading at the moment every day. And I can read more than that, but my minimum is two pages, and which means you're getting it done. And, you know, you can slot that in to just about any part of your life um but keep focused and follow your interest in terms of that reading so really use it to explore 
what particularly you are interested in about that subject. Do you have anything to say, Martin? I do. I, I, I totally agree with that because uh, a reading habit is hugely important. Here's a, here's a way to hack it more quickly uh, if you've got a couple of texts that you want to get through. Rather than buy the text and look at this 400 pages and think, <coughs> I get through this my advice would be to stick the text or the writer into iTunes or iTunes University and you'll often find a 40 minute lecture or a 50 minute lecture delivered by the same writer whoever that might be that kind of beautifully summarizes 400 pages in quite a kind of interesting and engaging way now if you can download that onto your phone and you happen to be on a bus or uh, you're going for a walk or whatever, you can you can get through 30 or 40 minutes worth of uh, material quite quickly and think, well, in a sense, what you've got there is a potted version of clearly what was a much more compl complex idea, but it might be enough to fire off kind of some understanding uh, and uh, it, it allows you to get through quite a lot of material. Yeah. So, um, yeah, sorry, go on. Brilliant. Well, I was going to say, um, we'll stop there. If anybody's got more questions, then please don't think that just because this is over, we won't answer them. I'm always happy to answer questions. Um, if you email them to me or come and write them on my Facebook page, I will answer them. Um, I just also want to say, as we finish off, thank you, everybody, because we've had well over 50 viewers throughout, and it's gone over 70 several times. So I just want to say thank you to everybody for giving us your time this evening. It's been an absolute pleasure and delight to be able to share this information with everyone and to be able to help you to achieve your dreams, because that is what we're doing. You know, the better your exam results, the more opportunities will open up to you in your life. And that is what I dearly, dearly want for every single one of you. So um, thank you for coming today and putting your trust in us. Um, I will send out the replay at some point tomorrow and attach as many of the resources I've talked about as I can remember. Um, if there's anything that isn't there, just let me know and I'll try and get that to you. Um, Martin, is there anything else you'd like to say? No, I've really enjoyed myself. Let's do it again sometime. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Great. No, this time next year, if not before. <laughs> Okay, yeah. take care, everyone, and thank Bye. you for being here. Bye. Bye.